Thank you. Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. Joining us tonight, Green Senator and Spokesperson on Defence, Scott Ludlam. The Minister for Justice with Oversight of the Federal Police, Michael Keenan. Author and human rights advocate, Randa Abdel Fattah. Academic and counter-terrorism expert, Anne Azza Ali. And the Shadow Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus. Please welcome our panel. The Q&A is simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio. You can join the Twitter conversation using the Quanda hashtag. And remember, if you've got a live question for us, add at Quanda to help us find it. Well, we asked our Facebook followers what they'd like to see discussed on Q&A tonight. They nominated the police raids, civil liberties and Australia's military action against ISIS. And our first question comes from Subana Biswas. 800 police officers, helicopters circling suburbs and only two men charged. Was there any real flight risk for each of these alleged terrorists who were all arrested at dawn in their own homes? What was the real need for such a public spectacle in the way in which each of these men were arrested? Michael Keenan. Uh, well, the need was that the authorities knew that there was a very high likelihood that these men were going to be taking action that would be random acts of violence uh, on the streets of Sydney, uh, including performing a demonstration execution. Now, I think under those circumstances, the Australian people would fully expect um, that the authorities would respond in force, uh, and that is what happened. Now, on the issue of two people charged, uh, I think uh, if the police had had their, had their, well, if they had their druthers, they would have liked that operation to have run on uh, for a longer period than it did. Um, but when they knew that they had, uh, that this group had received orders um, from a senior operative in the Middle East that violence was imminent, uh, then obviously the AFP and their New South Wales colleagues took action. When you say these men, um, do you mean there is a group? Because if there is, um, then only one of them has been charged with the sort of offence that you've described. Well, I mean, as I said, Tony, it's always a challenge for policing to be able to gather the evidence they need um, to charge people and then to have it hold up in a court of law. Now, this operation had been ongoing since May. Uh, but um, when the police understood that violence was imminent, um, they didn't have the opportunity to wait um, to a point where they might have liked to, to be able to collect the evidence that they might need to make those prosecutions. Um, they needed to disrupt what was going on. Um, and that was the decision that they took. It was an operational decision. Um, and the government thinks it was the right decision. Randa. Oh, where do I start? Um, your, your mention of the word spectacle, because this is really what it was about. Um, it, the timing of the raids, you know, the, the fact that it is happening one week before, it happened one week before, conveniently, the most decronian legislation is about to be announced. We have the fact that we're going, sending troops into Iraq. The whole, the whole way that the raids were televised, it was almost like an NCIS episode. It live, almost live feeds the fact that the police were providing, cover, um, you know, footage to, to the media, the, the wall-to-wall -wall coverage that we've seen in the media. You know, the Australian Lawyers Alliance have come out and said that the media coverage has seriously compromised the right of these people to a fair trial. And if we, we are serious about civil liberties, then we don't just say that these civil liberties are only applicable to everybody except Muslims. It, it should not be the case that you are innocent, you are guilty until proven innocent when it comes to Muslims. It, you cannot help but feel cynical about the timing of these raids, the fact that it is whipping people up into a frenzy of hysteria, of, of, of war fever, and, and the back-to-back -back coverage. I mean, Richard Ackland said it perfectly. It could have been done differently. It could have been done stealthily, proportionately, but that would have robbed the occasion for an opportunity of some serious theatre. But I would go one step further. Not only did it provide theatre. Not only did it give a sense of, for Australians to, to get behind this, you know, the, the, the raids and the wall-to-wall -wall coverage in the media, but it reinforced this wider narrative of Muslims as criminals, as Muslims as the antagonists of Australian values. And I'm very cynical about the government's use of these raids to politicise the Muslim, Muslim problem of terrorism. Some of those crisis. issues we'll come to in more detail. When you talk about whipping people up, um, at the same time, people are being whipped up on the other side of the equation. And tonight, uh, there's been a statement issued, a fatwa, in fact, by the spokesman for Islamic State, ISIS, uh, calling on their followers to kill Australians, to kill Canadians and Europeans mm. and Americans, to not consult with anyone, not seek anyone's advice, whether they're civilian or military, mm. the same ruling applies. Um, does that change the equation in your mind at all? 
look, no one, and especially as a Muslim, I am horrified about what, about the use of Islam in this way. But what I want to say is this. It's been 13 years now since the war on terror. And if we are still at a point where, as a Muslim, I must convince you that Islam is unequivocally against terrorism, is unequivocally against these sorts of actions, this barbarity in the name of religion, I'm very sorry to say, but that is not my failure, it is yours. Because countless fatwas have been issued from the most senior clerics in the Muslim world, distancing Islam from these horrible, terrible actions. And so it's about time that we realise that Muslims and Islam have nothing to do with these barbaric actions and the Muslim community shouldn't be held liable for what is happening overseas and, and be demonised and targeted in this way. I'm equally horrified by the latest fatwa. But and, and, and no one is denying the risk. No one is saying that there isn't a credible risk that, that, that we face in Australia. What we are saying is the approach. The way that this is being handled is being used to feed a wider narrative that simply serves perp the purpose of whipping people up into more of an Islamophobic environment. Okay. And, okay. So, sorry, sorry. Uh, and Ali, do you have the same view of the raids? Um, I, have, I have some of the same view. I have um, a lot of confidence in our law enforcement and our police officers, and I think that um, all Australians need to be um, at least partly confident that if our police officers and our law enforcement are um, investigating a criminal act, that we, as Australians and, um, and um, as taxpayers, need to understand that uh, they have um, knowledge that perhaps we don't know. I'm not privy to what ASIO knows, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to be privy to, privy to what ASIO or the AFP or what the police know, whether whether that's um, uh, cause for them to send 800 uh, police officers into the raid or not, um, I think that's something that should come out um, and should should come out through strategic communications of the AFP and the police force. In terms of whipping up fear, and I've read the um, the uh, comments that uh, came out today from ISIS, this is not new. For many, many generations and for many, many years, terrorists have always been um, putting out uh, threats verbally. This is as much a war of rhetoric as it is um, a war of ideas and a war of four hearts and minds. And I think the words are very important and we do need to pay attention to how we frame what we're doing um, as much as we pay attention to how they're, they're framing the threats that they're giving uh, and, and putting out on social media uh, to Australians. So, you know, threats to Australians and threats to anybody who challenged the ISIS state, uh, this is not the first time they've come out. They came out... Uh, from the very beginning when the US um, hinted that there might be airstrikes, there were um, uh, calls for people to carry out acts of violence um, in their homelands, whether that be in Australia or, or America or any, any state that challenged um, ISIS. So these are threats that we have to take seriously. Um, and do I, you, uh, just to go back to the yeah. point made by the questioner and by Randa to some degree, um, do you think this was a kind of manufactured spectacle or a legitimate uh, series of raids? All terrorism is theatre and all counter-terrorism is theatre. Um, so yes, it was a manufactured spectacle, but that's what counter-terrorism is. That's what security is. You know, um, you, go, you go to an airport, and I used to say this to my students, you go to an airport and you go through all of these, all of these things. I could go down to Toys R Us and, and, and construct something like this and get one of those lightsaber things that goes zhut, zhut, and every time you walk into my classroom, I could go, wait a minute, zhut, zhut. And that it'd have an effect, because that's what security is, that's what counterterrorism is, that's what terrorism is. It's all about theatre. So I think we have to accept that there is an element in th of, of theatre, because this is essentially about perception. And it is about convincing people and changing people's minds to a particular world view, whether that world view is that of ISIS and the Islamic State or whether that world view is that of the Australian government and um, democratic values and so on and so forth. Let's ask Mark Dreyfus if he agrees with that idea that what we're seeing is a kind of theatre designed to deter people from becoming radical or being influenced by radicalism? With all respect to Anne, I don't think of terrorism as theatre and I don't think of counter-terrorism as theatre either. Terrorism involves the commission of real crimes, real murders, real injury to real people. And counter-terrorism is the efforts of our agencies to deal with the threat of those crimes being committed. And right in one sense, terrorists want to send a message uh, they want to achieve an effect uh, by the kinds of crimes that they commit. 
Uh, and one of the things they want is to spread dissension and division in the Australian community. So we have to be on guard against that. Uh, they want repression to follow from their acts of terror. And again, we have to be on guard against that too. But no, I don't think, as Anne has said, that counter-terrorism is theatre. Um, we have a need to deal with a real risk. It's a risk that I think is a manageable one. That's why we have resourced our agencies over many years to deal with these real risks and why our agencies have in fact been able to interrupt uh, a number of serious terror plots uh, that pose the risk of mass casualty events here in Australia uh, over Ludlam. the last few years. Sorry, Scott Ludlam. Yes, the contrast to me is seeing how over a period of more than a year the government has handled Operation Sovereign Borders with a complete media blackout where the press gallery around the country and the Australian public and parliamentarians have been locked out of any understanding at all of what is being done effectively, as we're told, in the name of national security. And yet, for these raids the other day, uh, you know, journalists are being invited along and given footage, and it's basically designed, I think, uh, to... To me, that feels like the element of, of theatre. Not the raids per se, but the extraordinary media circus that goes on around it. I don't understand what that is for if not to increase tension. Like, I don't know who here felt safer as a result of saturation media coverage of that thing. And that's the part that I guess I don't understand. Uh, Michael Keenan, do you want to buy into this? I mean... Uh, well, I really is, do. Is there a kind of logic, <laughs> yes, of course, but is there yeah. a logic uh, to creating a kind of theatre to deter people? Well, uh, look, I, I reject that whole premise of a theatre. I mean, there was... Raids at over half a, uh, raids at over a dozen locations uh, all around Sydney, and there was some subsequent activity in Queensland. Um, and of course, if you're going to send armed police uh, into such a, an enormous number of locations in a city, then of course people are going to notice. Uh, and it's up to the police to inform people about what is going on. Um, so look, I don't, um, you know, I don't uh, accept that this is some form of theatre. I mean, this is the police making operational decisions based on the safety of their officers from some very dangerous people. Uh, and I really want to address a couple of things. Uh, importantly, the timing. Uh, now, the idea that this is some conspiracy from the government, because we're putting through um, some foreign fighter legislation through Parliament this week, um, is just not, just not uh, measurable by the facts. Uh, the timing of these things is an operational decision for the police. This is not a political decision that is taken. The police make the decisions about when they are going to do these things. Uh, and I, as a police minister, are usually briefed um, just prior to the raids occurring. So it would be perfectly normal for me to be briefed the night before these raids were occurring. So is that what idea... happened? In fact, you didn't know about the raids until the night before? No, I mean, that? I knew about the ongoing operation, but no, I didn't know uh, but the operational activity. And that is, that, that is perfectly uh, in line with standard procedure, and I suspect Mark, as a former Attorney General, will back me up on that. Um, it is very normal that the police would inform the government about what it's doing um, prior to the raids occurring, and obviously they do that for operational secrecy. Um, so the idea that the government directed the timing of these raids is nonsense. The police directed the timing, and they did it because they thought, uh, well, they had very credible information, um, that there was a significant threat of violence within the next couple of days from those raids. Um, so. You know, but you have to admit that the timing is uncanny. Yeah, what a coincidence. No, Amazing. No, you know what, I, you know what I, I really don't. Uh, you really don't think no, it's uncanny I, at all? I, I, look, the whole point is they acted because there was information that they had that a senior operative in the Middle East had instructed his followers in Australia to go about and commit random and barbaric acts of violence on Australian citizens and it was going to happen within days. What would you expect the police to do in those circumstances? There are they don't people respond in the Middle East instructing agenda. them every day on social media. We have I'm no sorry, this idea what influence means. For their we have no to go idea. We are making arrests based on somebody tweeting something, somebody saying chatter. something, some, some chatter. chatter. We have no understanding yet of what influence means, of just how influential or, or how attractive these fatwas um, or these directives coming out of the Middle East are. And we're making arrests based on that. Look, well, look, Anne, you said it yourself. I mean, you don't know all that the AFP and ASIO knows. 
Um, they are our security authorities. Um, they do an exceptionally good job about keeping the Australian people safe. Um, the idea that they respond to the government's tune on these things is not correct. Um, they take the operational decisions that they take based on public safety. Okay. And that is what happened in the city. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to cut you all off. We've got quite a few questions to get to. They're all on similar subjects. We will get specifically to the anti-terror laws. Uh, our next question is from Sally Lord. Thanks, Tony. It's been stated that uh, poverty and illiteracy um, are strong factors that um, influence young Islamic men and boys uh, to become rad radicalised or make them vulnerable to radicalisation. These conditions don't appear to be the case in Australia. So what, what do you think are the motivators or the triggers for this in Australia? And Ali, we'll start with you. Sally, you make a really good point there. Absolutely, they don't seem to be the triggers. I think the, um, the, the this kind of myth of, of marginalisation has been uh, really overemphasised in, in radicalisation. The fact is that we really don't know a lot about radicalisation, uh, and that's because everybody's path to or trajectory to violence has been different. We can get some broad demographics. Um, out of several case studies, but all we can manage is just that, broad demographics. There is no terrorist profile. And this idea of vulnerability that, you know, there are these um, masses of Muslims lying in wait, just waiting, vulnerable Muslims lying in wait, waiting to be radicalised, is a complete myth. It's completely wrong. Um, so, you know, what turns a young person to become radicalised? There are a number of factors. Some of it, some, for some of them, they, are, they, they have some life-changing experiences. What we know is that for all of them, they all start out by seeking, uh, with a seeking behaviour, a behaviour of curiosity. And that might lead them to the internet, which plays an extremely important role. Um, and they might start looking at the internet and start looking for answers on the internet. Now, most of them will walk away from there. We'll stop there and walk away. Community leaders talk about uh, Sheikh YouTube. Um, yeah. she and Sheikh Google. Google Sheikh, yeah. Sheikh Google, yeah, Sheikh yeah. Google. And absolutely, like we're assuming here that, you know, these young people are going to mosques and, you know, there's a, there's a firebrand cleric at the mosque yelling at them, you know, you have to go and fight and all of this. No, they're not listening to their community leaders. Um, they're not listening to their sheikhs who are, who are uh, very, very moderate and, um, and trying to guide them along the right path. They're going on to YouTube, they're going to Sheikh Google and they're finding radical sheikhs all around the world in other countries who are, uh, who are misguiding them, who are giving them a, um, a misguided interpretation of, of text. But a lot of them, it's not about religion. And uh, for many of them, they actually don't know very much about their religion. Uh, so it's other things. It's the social factor. It's uh, the, the adventure. It's the idea of wanting to be a hero. It's the uh, very much the idea of, um, of of victimhood and trying to to save um, an oppressed what they believe to be oppressed peoples. So for many of them, the the motivations aren't necessarily evil or bad motivations. Uh, some of them are going there because they think they're doing something good. They think they're you, saving you've, you've Muslims. You've worked with a number of former jihadis, um, yep. all of which I think now live in the UK. They all live um, in the UK. And you work with them online to try and work out a de-radicalisation plan. How do you actually do that? How do you deprogram people if they've gone down this path? Well, deprogramming is, is probably um, a bit of a misleading word because mm. that assumes that it's all about psychology and these people have somehow um, it's some kind of psychological aberration. Um, what we do is we look at how can a former uh, what we call formers, people who have who have uh, um, been on down the path, who have who have who have fought overseas and then returned. Um, we look at how formers might contact these young people who seem to be engaging with uh, violent extremist narratives online. And I have to say that they're not just all Muslim. We also deal with neo-Nazi white supremacists as well. Um, and um, we we look at how they might then talk to these young people and give them a different point of view. Get them to shift uh, their world view a bit and look at some of the consequences, perhaps, of going to fight overseas. Look at, um, look at uh, some of the um, um, reasons why they shouldn't go and fight overseas. So we're looking at what works with engaging young people who may be going down that path of radicalisation. OK, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in the next question, which is on a related matter, and then bring in the other uh, panellists. And that's a question from uh, Prashant Chattaverdi. 
Thanks, Tony. My question to the panel is, what do you think is the role of the Islamic community and the broader community in Australia to ensure that the boys and girls don't take a wrong direction? And do you think the community to take, needs to take more accountability of the actions of these men and women? Randa. Well, I think this is one of the problems in the way that we frame this whole conversation about radicalization. We make it a Muslim problem. I, look, everything that you said, Anne, I completely agree with. But the one thing that we never raise is that this is a problem of the whole community, of our whole society. And the one thing that we never address is the role of Western foreign policy and the grievances, legitimate grievances that causes people. That doesn't mean that everybody who is aggrieved by the way that the West intervenes in the Middle East is going to become radicalised. But why is it that we choose to ignore that elephant in the room? The role of Western foreign policy and its, and its role in creating such an unjust world and particularly its role in creating the mess in the Middle East that we see. You know, the the fact that we had the decimation of Gaza by Israel two months ago and the conspiracy of silence, in fact I'll go even further, the, le the legitimating and justification giving Israel a license to kill, does that not fuel anger? Does that not plant the seeds? We go around in the West trying to cut down the trees of terrorism even as we plant seeds of terrorism and we do that. We do that when we allow Israel to get away with its war crimes. We do that when we support the US blindly. We say, the US says jump, we say how high, even though the US takes the moral high ground, even as it rains down drones and, and cruise missiles on civilian populations, engages in torture, extraordinary rendition, it takes the moral high ground. We plant the seeds of terrorism when we turn our backs on 200,000 Syrians dead, Iraqis killed, and suddenly we're, we're moved to humanitarian action because of, of some YouTube videos because Westerners are threatened and killed. These are legitimate concerns. These are not excuses for the barbarity that we're seeing. But it is completely insane for us to ignore that these are really serious issues and that there are some people who are going to take these legitimate concerns and, and go down a radical path. But until we address those root causes, and I don't say that just as a Muslim, there are many non-Muslim analysts who would say the same thing. Until we address those root causes and stop thinking this is a Muslim pathology, we are never going to be able to address radicalisation. Michael. Well, the first point I want to make, which is very important, is that nothing the government is doing is targeted at any particular community in Australia. Um, we're targeting... Well, I can assure you that that is not the case. We are targeting criminals. That's what we're doing. We're targeting criminals. Uh, and we will always follow criminals if we think that they are doing the wrong thing. We will always track them down and prosecute them to the maximum extent of Australia. So are you going to track down the Australian Defence League soldiers who post up on Facebook from Bombardier? Look, because if you're uh, going to introduce your thoughts about that, I hope they apply across the, across I, the board. I, I can assure you that the, cir it, the circumstances were the same that if we were any group in society that threatened the safety of the Australian community, of course we would take action. And the idea that we are targeting happened. elements of the Australian community is wrong and it would be very foolish for the Australian government to do that. Can I just, um, uh, can I just pick up on that point, though? I mean, the Australian Defence League has evidently, or oh, allegedly, threatened to bomb mosques. It's threatened the lives of people. Um, it has... Uh, threatened women, photographs women, in fact, um, wearing uh, the burqa or so on, and does behave in threatening ways. Is it time the federal police treated them as seriously or, or well, in well, some well, way uh, you're, you're, as seriously? You're, you're assuming that they don't um, police these groups in the same way as they would police any other group in the community. But not in a public way. You, uh, so, I mean, would you, would you, for example, countenance raids uh, by the federal police on... At uh, the headquarters of that organisation or on individuals you, within... Can that I assure you, and every person in Australia, if there was a group that we knew was about to go and randomly kill Australian citizens, no matter who they are, we would take action. Um, we don't apply uh, the, the law based on people's background. We apply it based on what we would see or what we would understand to be the threat to We've the Australian We've got a hand up community. in the front there. We'll just, well, just got to wait till we get a, a microphone point, uh, the idea to you. The Australian government does not target sections of the Australian community. In, in, in the front row, there is a hand up, so I'll just go to that uh, questioner. Go ahead. The ADL make threats to myself and my family, telling them that they want to behead me. So everything you're saying right now is very insulting. 
Uh, well, if, if that is the case, then uh, you, you need to I have reported the it to the police and numerous look, times, well, thank you. Well, let me assure you, we don't police in a way in this country that targets one group over another. Yes, I can you assure do. you that that is the case. Yes, you do. Uh, well... I'm not uh, sure the message is getting through, whether you sense the reaction of the room and you said that for the first time. Mm. I'm not sure if that is the strategy well, that it's getting well, through. I mean, part of what we're doing, we're spending $630 million addressing this problem. Part of that money will be spent on community outreach. Uh, we will not win this fight if sections of the Australian community do not believe that the Australian government is on their side. Uh, I'm sorry if people in the room feel that that is the case, um, but I can assure you that it is not. I, I'm we just do gonna, not target the Muslims. Uh, and, uh, Michael Kenner, can I, can I just interrupt for a second because um, that was a pretty extraordinary allegation. Um, mm. I'd, I'd just like you to... Are you saying that an official of the security forces did this? I've reported it to Bankstown Police Station on numerous occasions. They've called to um, slit my, the child, my, my children's throats and rape my dead caucus on the side of the road. Well, so, uh, so are you saying, sorry, you're saying this is coming from racist groups? Yes. Yeah, well, I mean, I can assure you I that threats of that nature would be followed up. I am trolled hours a day on Facebook and social media because of these, these right-wing Nazis, OK? My life is not pleasant right now living in this country and no one seems to care. Because I'm Muslim and they're not. It's all right for the non-Muslims to give me a hard time. Well, well, but when I, I complain not, about it, it's not the same. Not. Look, Michael, it's absolutely no excuse for anyone in the community to attack another Australian in an unprovoked way. Well, okay. I'd like to see and, the and, evidence that you're well, actually doing something can I, about can I, can I just, right now. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Any... I'm sorry to do this to you. I'm just, just okay. confirming you're not saying that was security officials. You're saying that was a racist group that's made these threats against you. Well, it, look, it's the ADL, yes. Yeah, well, I can assure right. you that. I beg your pardon. Oh, you said ADL. I thought you said ASIA. Okay, oh, oh. now, <laughs> that, I, I thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for clarifying that. But we've got a question on a similar. We've got a, I'm, I'm sorry, that was a misunderstanding. We've got a question on a similar subject from Asfami. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, as, as I was on my way to work, I was uh, physically attacked by a man who called me an effing terrorist. Now, with the recent. Um, uh, onslaught of negative media attention towards the Muslim community, many visible Muslims, um, many of whom are Muslim women who wear the hijab, have been subject to verbal abuse and at times physical attacks. Now, language has been key in inflaming tensions. So what does the panel think of Tony Abbott's use of the divisive term Team Australia and um, just the language used by politicians in order to, um, you know, uh, keep the Muslim community as the chosen bogeyman. I was going to start with Mark Dreyfus on this. Um, every Australian has the right to walk everywhere in our community, on the street, dressed however they wish to dress, be it in a hijab, in a burqa, <laughs> be, it, be it a Sikh, a Sikh in a turban or a Jew wearing a yarmulke. Everyone has the right to walk in the street. We've, we've been through this debate over the last year in relation to Section 18C, which is not about religious discrimination, it was about racial discrimination. Uh, I would like to think that we can get to Australia where not in one now, uh, where people are not threatened on the street, where uh, the kind of complaint that you've just articulated for all of us, which shocks me uh, to think and if I can go back to the, the earlier questions, uh, the reason why I think there was a reaction in the audience to um, the suggestion that there wasn't an unevenness in policing, uh, Michael's right, of course, that we don't set out to have unevenness in policing. Uh, the police investigate crimes and threaten crimes wherever they occur. But the fact that some people, including many people in this audience, have the impression that there is uneven policing raises for me a really big question, which is about confidence in our agencies, confidence in the intelligence work, confidence in the police. And part of the job of government and part of the job of every politician in Australia is to make sure that the community has that confidence. And I fear from what you've said and what you've also said, us, is that there's a gap. Clearly there's a gap. Uh, there's a whole lot more work to be done and it fits together as it happens with countering violent extremism. Um, I was going to Randy, you've actually studied uh, Islamophobia. Um, mm. In fact, you are in the process of studying yeah. it. Um, so what do you take from the questions we're getting now? 
Well, you know, there's been a huge backlash since the terror raids and we're seeing, uh, you know, the invective and the obscenity online, on social media. We're seeing Muslim women at the front line because they're obviously visibly identifiable in their hijabs as Muslims and people pin their anxieties and fears and hatreds onto those women and they have to suffer. The, the, the most horrible rate, um, verbal and physical abuse. We're seeing a huge increase in Islamophobic incidents. But what I want to focus on is the fact that, like you said, it is the perception that the Muslim community is being targeted. The Muslim community is the only community that was consulted about the terror laws because it is the image that is projected is that terrorism is, the, uh, is a Muslim issue, that the Muslim, the Muslim population is a problem population. And the, the language of Team Australia, I mean, the, the, I, Scott Pointing is a sociologist and he, he cites Canadian criminologist Barbara Perry and says states confer permission to hate on their citizens. And the way they do that is that when they encounter a certain population, a certain community as the enemy in the war on terror, they somehow give a moral license or permission to members of the community to encounter that community as an enemy. Um, it's almost as though they're emboldening Islamophobia. And we've seen a direct correlation. The terror raids occurred and a huge increase in Islamophobic incidents. And the Team Australia example, it, it, it's, it's the language of division. It's the language of inclusion and exclusion. First, you have the fact that 40% of Australians were born here. Australian Muslims were born here. And yet the assumption is that we came here. And then, again, it's this idea of a benevolent Anglo majority schooling and managing a deviant Muslim minority. This is this is the message that is being sent, whether unwittingly or not, by leadership, and it emboldens Islamophobia, Islamophobes, when that message of division and deviance is 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 coming from the highest leaders of the country, and that is why people feel empowered by those by those sorts of messages mm. to attack Muslim women who wear the hijab as the as the incarnation of everything that that we see as evil in Australia. And it's not fair for Muslim women to have to undergo that. Michael Keenan. Uh, well, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's absolutely not fair for anyone to be targeted as they go about their business in Australia um, for being part of a particular, uh, for, for being of a particular background. Uh, we don't accept that. Uh, we certainly don't empower it. Uh, and we do everything we can to discourage it. Uh, now, we would take any complaints of that nature incredibly seriously. Uh, we will certainly, I will certainly make sure that uh, the issue that... Uh, uh, the young lady down there has raised has been thoroughly investigated. I will follow up on that and I will get back to you about it. Um, the government takes this incredibly seriously, <coughs> where it pains to point out that we are not targeting any section of the Australian population. Uh, if that um, thought uh, were to take hold, I think it was going it would make our job much harder because the government does not stand against any section of its own population. Um, we want to work with all sections of the Australian community and I can assure you that the Islamic community is a very important part of I that. I think what people don't realise is you can exclude people in a racist way but you can also include them in a racist way and the way that you do that is through your language and so it's by saying you, you know as long as you as you follow our Australian way, our Australian values, our core values, that is a way of, of including people but always qualifying their acceptance and their belonging and managing them, managing them and schooling them. The, the idea that Muslims Muslims are a policed and a policed community within the larger community. Okay, I'm going to go to a video question that, uh, and again, it's obviously driven by um, some of the debates that are going on in the community. This one is a video from Peter Sonners from the Gold Coast in Queensland. Regarding the recent terrorism-related arrests, should we be discussing the issue of possibly restricting the flow of further Muslim migration to this country? until we see evidence of better success in integration of the people who are already here. Oh, Scott Ludlam. I think that's an excellent case study, really, of what we're trying to discuss here. What, <laughs> what it reminded me of a little bit, what I was thinking of the conversation before, is a really important piece of the puzzle is the very tight feedback loop between media and the politicians around this stuff. And seeing the way that the tabloid papers in this country at the moment are choosing to, to deal with the issue as well is hurling fear at people every morning. And the, that's what the politicians are getting for breakfast. That's what their media advisors are putting in front of them. And I think it's creating an immensely tight feedback loop. No, I don't think we need to uh, do some kind of national character assessment of Muslims while we restrict immigration. Um, Australia is one of the most successful examples of multiculturalism anywhere in the world and the kind of divisiveness, I guess, and, and 
you know, people in the community will be taking their lead in part by what they hear from political representatives and what they see in the, in the press. Uh, I think, in fact, that kind of fear, that is what terrorism is. It's that corrosion and that undermining of the underpinnings of society. We've done bloody well here in Australia, I would say, and we need to protect that. Um, and that includes protecting everybody in this country. Um, uh, Anne. Well, what I find um, quite distressing about that is uh, back in... This is, this is a legacy of post 9-11 um, discourse in, in Australia where immigration, uh, asylum seekers, uh, Muslim women in particular, uh, Muslims in general, and terrorism were all lumped into one and, uh, and, and constructed as this big problem that Australia has to deal with. The idea of, of, of Muslims not integrating into Australian society, you've got two Muslim women sitting here on this panel. Um, and there are successful Muslims um, around Australia, numerous successful Muslims all around Australia. 99.99% uh, .99 of Muslims are good, law-abiding citizens and taxpayers, I might add. Um, so the idea that we must wait and see um, whether or not Muslims integrate into Australia, Muslims have been here for a very, very long time. Um, and uh, I, I, it just, you know, 14 years on and we're still talking the same talk. We need to move on. OK, I'm going to uh, move on as well because we promised we'd talk about the uh, anti-terror laws. We've got a question from uh, Mona Elbaba. As a Muslim lawyer practising criminal law in Western Sydney, I experience firsthand the distrust between my community and the law enforcement agencies, especially the intimidation and harassment tactics used by these agencies under the existing legislation. Are the new anti-terror laws that are currently being tabled before Parliament really necessary to prevent terrorism? Or are they a political wedge aimed at drumming up fear and xenophobia towards Islam and Muslims to score cheap political points? OK, I'll start with our politicians. And uh, I don't know whether we've got the microphone there in time to hear that you are, in fact, a Muslim lawyer practising criminal law in Western Sydney. Scott Ludlam. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned. Um, there's some of the laws that we haven't seen. They're being announced by press conference. And so two really significant packages the parliament hasn't seen yet. Um, the one that we have seen, um, very serious expansion of ASIO powers that might be debated tomorrow or the next day. I have a fundamental problem with the idea that in order to protect our freedoms, we need to abolish them one by one. I think that's really scary. That's part of what makes this country um, great. So, Specifically, what aspects of the new laws do you object to? Uh, I think what we're seeing at the moment is an attempt um, to criminalise public interest whistleblowing. It doesn't go directly to your question, but uh, to prevent a repeat of, um, I guess, what happened in the United States, where an analyst disclosed extraordinarily uh, unlawful behaviour at the heart of, of the US security establishment, and, and the Australian government doesn't want that to happen here, evidently. I guess I've been through a couple of turns of the wheel. I can remember when the sedition laws were passing in 2005, hearing exactly the same thing from communities that were feeling targeted, uh, not, not necessarily by media messaging, but targeted by knocks on the door and quiet conversations with agents and, and police. So I, I can't imagine what it must be like, but it feels very familiar. We're back somewhere where we've been before. Um, I'm going to go to Mark Dreyfus. Um because the Labor Party has been considering these new laws and whether it will support them. Have you come to a conclusion? Well, I'm not going to give you a general answer, Tony, because... Maybe one, give one, us some specific ones. I will. Uh, but one, one, one of the problems of, uh, of this, the whole debate we've been having is the government's presented this as one huge wrapped-up bundle of laws and mixed with the international uh, activity as well. Um, i just unpick it briefly to say that there's a bill in the Senate introduced by the Attorney-General on the 16th of July, which is a long-standing proposal, first uh, proposed by the Labor government in May 2012. It has nothing to do with Iraq or Syria or with the current uh, terrorist uh, activities that have been uncovered. Uh, it's an updating of an Act of Parliament, the ASIO Act, which was passed in 1979. And Largely, there's bipartisan agreement on that package. It's been much consulted on. There was a report by the Intelligence Committee, which I tabled in June last year, and the government has brought forward a year later 
um, that updating of the ASIO. Okay, let's go through a couple of specifics. But five the, year, the, no, let's just some specifics. Five year jail sentence aimed at hate preachers who incite or urge others to do acts of terrorism. Will you support that? that wasn't well, I'm not going to. Now, the next bill is the one that the Attorney General has not shown to anyone. Mm -hmm. It's going to be first introduced in the Parliament this Wednesday. Under no circumstances am I giving you an mm -hmm. opinion on anything to do with that bill until we've seen it and until there's been public scrutiny and public consultation over an appropriate period. So I've What's asked an appropriate period, by the way? Well, s several weeks. Uh, for st and, but again, I haven't seen the bill, so it might be that it's longer. Uh, I've said to the government already, because the government's indicated to us in a very short briefing last week, uh, sketched out for us what's going to be in this legislation, and I've said it must go to a parliamentary committee, the Joint Intelligence Committee, for public hearing and public submissions to be made on it, because I think that every time a government is putting forward proposals to uh, reduce rights and liberties in Australia, to expand the powers of our intelligence agencies or our police, the government has to make the case. Okay, and I'm just going to go to back to uh, yes, uh, lawyer uh, Mona El Baba has her hand up, and I'm, I actually am quite interested to go back to you and find out are there specific aspects of the coming new laws as you've read about them that you um, object to. Just point to I'm um, just continuing one from the Shadow Attorney General's um, point. How serious? Is the government in taking into consideration the public submissions into these draft amendments, especially um, taking um, into consideration the fact that the Muslim leaders were given only half an hour to consider the proposed amendments uh, um, at the meeting, essentially? Well, that well really is a, that's probably uh, an issue for Michael Keenan to answer, but you can briefly... Well, if I can briefly to say to you, Mona, that's a hopelessly inadequate period. Uh, I'm concerned if the Muslim leadership is the only consultation the government's yet done. It should be the entire community. Mm. And as I understand it, they were not shown the draft bill. Nobody's been shown the draft bill. There needs to be a, an appropriate period where everybody can read the proposed legislation, everybody can have a say on it, and there can be public hearings and a parliamentary committee okay. reporting to the parliament. Let's go to uh, Michael Keane. I'll bring you back to the first question um, asked by uh, Mona, and that is... Uh, is this a political wedge aimed at drumming up xenophobia? That were her words. Uh, well, I hope I've answered that uh, from some of my early contributions, Mona. I mean, this is not. This is a sensible response from the government to change the security circumstances in Australia. Mm. Uh, and the reason that the bill hasn't been put out for public consultation yet is because it's only just been um, completed. Um, when we've, you know, the situation, the security situation in Australia changed quite rapidly uh, in response to events in the Middle East in particular. Mm -hmm. And we needed to respond to that and we've been working diligently with our security agencies um, to get up a package that we believe will be the appropriate um, balance between protecting our liberties and making sure the Australian community is safe. So, Michael, what's already been floated in the public, uh, five-year jail sentences aimed at hate preachers who incite others to do acts of terrorism, tougher arrests and questioning of suspects on reasonable grounds, a new way of choosing who the suspects who can be questioned uh, are, um, secret searches of homes, easier issuing of control orders and a 10-year extension of the sunset clauses around the existing preventative detention rules. Can you confirm all of those? Uh, well, that is a reasonable summary about some of the things we will be doing. I wouldn't quite characterise it in exactly the same way as you have done. Um, but what we want to do is we want to have a modern and flexible legislative arrangement um, that allows the Australian Federal Police and ASIO to deal with the changed circumstances on the ground. Now, we've had anti-terror laws in this country for over 10 years. Uh, we've learnt something about um, the utility of some provisions within that regime. And we want to make sure that we've got a, a regime that now deals with these changed circumstances. And we do live in a heightened threat environment. There is no question of that. We live in a heightened threat environment. Um, and look, the, the, and the best way I can illustrate that is the first tranche of anti-terror laws, in particular, well, going back 10 years ago under the Howard government, um, was uh, largely in response to the fact that we had 30 Australian citizens go and fight in Afghanistan. Uh, 25 of those citizens returned to Australia and subsequently 19 of them were involved in terrorism related activity. Now we have up to 160 Australian citizens either fighting with or supporting uh, ISIL uh, and other related terrorist organisations. Don't overstate it, Michael. 
Oh, I'm not overstating it. That is actually the facts. Where, well, where, where have I overstated the, the, it, Mark? It, you want, it's this compilation that we've seen this a lot from the government. Mm. The figure that the government has given is that about 60 Australians have gone to fight in Syria or Iraq. And, and are about supporting. about 100 are here in Australia supporting in various ways. Exactly so don't lump it together. Oh, I'm sorry, that's exactly what I said. I said there was 160 <laughs> well, people who were involved either directly fighting with or supporting uh, ISIL. That's what I said. OK, Scott Logan um, want to get in there, and yeah. then I'll go to uh, Anne and then Randa. Because you said that we learned some things about the installation of those terror laws under the Howard government, and indeed we did. The terror reviewer, uh, which the Labor government legislated, mm -hmm. said a lot of this body of law is obsolete or dangerous and should be repealed. And yet, if that's what you consider the learnings, you defunded the office and tried to abolish the guy. So we don't even well, have a terror laws reviewer seven. at the moment. Well, uh, and you're actually doubling down and extending a lot of the things like preventative detention that were proposed to be abandoned. So when you say we learned from these terror laws, I'm, I'm not sure maybe that, that you've been reading the stuff that's being produced by the government's own officers. Yeah, well, we have uh, by ASIO and the AFP, and we've been getting the feedback from our security agencies no. about what has worked and what hasn't. And we've crafted this suite of laws with their advice in mind. Um, and they are the ones who are actually best placed to well, tell the government the what Well, stop the presses. Intelligence agencies want more power. Well, I'm, look, <laughs> this I'm is so a democracy. I'm sorry, Scott. When this isn't Hollywood. I mean, our intelligence agencies are just diligent public Stop servants. Stop making it look like Hollywood. Well, I'm ben. sorry. Our intelligence agencies are diligent public servants whose job it is to protect Australia. OK. Um, and they take it very seriously. Right. And, you know, there's not anything uh, nefarious or worrying about that. Uh, I just want to bring in and Ali. And let me ask you this, because we were talking about the numbers mm. of people overseas. Now, I know that you actually do regard the numbers of foreign fighters, um, in Syria in particular, from Australia, as being comparatively high. Mm. It is. It is comparatively high compared to um, the US, which has an estimated 100 um, foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq. So Australia to have an estimated 60 is, is comparatively high. But I'd like to take some time to, to qualify the threat and the risk, and let's really look at whether or not these laws are going to be effective because I don't think anybody here would deny um, would deny any kinds of laws that are there for everybody's public safety as long as they are effective and as long as they are needed, which are two questions that are consistently being asked about the current um, proposals. So the first thing I want to say is in terms of, of, of risk and threat, um, what have we got? We've got a, a, an estimated 60 foreign fighters. We're assuming that they're going to come here and want to carry out um, a terrorist attack here, so we've said that that's a threat. We've got a further estimated 100 here who's, who might support um, the Islamic State or show some kind of support for the Islamic State, although we don't exactly know what the, that support means. And we're assuming that they're going to carry out, uh, perhaps carry out a terrorist attack here in Australia, and we've quantified, qualified that as a threat. Uh, the other threat that we've got is um, the numerous uh, numbers of people who may also become radicalised and largely because of uh, hard counter-terrorism measures um, that then feed into a division in the community uh, and we've got nothing to address that threat. So I've got nothing against legal options but let's be smart about what we're doing here. All very well and good to have the legal options there as long as they're needed and as long as they don't impinge on civil liberties and as long as they are even-handed, so they're not just targeting Muslims, but also that ADL who puts up on their Facebook page, this is how you make a homemade weapon, everybody go and make one and kill yourself a Muslim. As long as they, that is even-handed there, I have no problem with that. But where's all the other stuff to, to address radicalisation at its roots? Where's all the social programs? Where's all the family counselling programs? Where are all, the, all the, the, the programs to address at its very core why young people are becoming radicalised so in the first So these are programs, just, just to make this clear, because you've worked with the UK, mm. you're talking about programs that exist in other countries but don't exist here, is that right? We don't have anything here, but, you know, you, Germany, for example, has a program called Exit Germany, um, mm. and they have in there, uh, within that, a family counselling program for um, uh, families of young people who are becoming radicalised or who are thinking, uh, showing signs that they may want to uh, go uh, and join the Islamic State to fight. The UK has adopted that program. Um, the Netherlands have adopted that program and Canada has adopted that program. We here, we've had 
in all with 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 uh, giving credit where credit's due, we've had a countering violent extremism program for some years. A lot of that focus has been on community level engagement, and community level engagement has its limits. We haven't engaged with families. We haven't engaged with mothers. Mothers play a hugely significant role, especially with um, with their their young sons. Um, we haven't engaged with the individuals themselves. It's not communities that become radicalised. It's individuals that okay. become radicalised. Um, I'm sure you want to answer that, and I'm going to ask you to do that in context with other questions um, coming up, because okay. we've got to get to a few things. Um, you're watching Q&As live. It's interactive. And tonight, we're asking you to help choose a question for our panel, because we're running out of time. If you're on Twitter, check the last two at Quanda tweets. Each one is a potential question. Retweet the one you'd prefer. We'll put the most popular question to our panel. First, let's take a question from Marty Duck. Thanks, Tony. Uh, is the rise of ISIS, at least in part, a result of the power vacuum created by the removal of Saddam Hussein and the subsequent attempt to impose Western democracy on the region? Mm. And might our resources be better channeled into more humanitarian and diplomatic efforts rather than further military action? Scott Ludlam. I think it goes back to the strategic amnesia that you mentioned before, and we're seeing this played out at very senior levels in the Australian government and I fear in the United States government as well, that um, seeing Prime Minister Howard on TV saying uh, he was embarrassed, 600,000 people died um, as a result of that occupation and the sectarian carnage that we helped unleash, uh, you know, embarrassed just doesn't cut it for me. So I think then for the Prime Minister to engage in the split-second deployment, practically before President Obama had closed his mouth, and certainly before the rest of the world is there, we've deployed uh, with initially humanitarian, then just no boots on the ground, and suddenly we're running weapons into one particular side of a really gruesome civil war, and there are 600 pairs of boots on the ground or certainly on their way uh, in there at the moment. I think we are at grave risk of simply repeating and pouring fuel on a fire that we helped start. So what we would like to see, I mean, you're probably aware we would like to have seen that deployment decision put to Parliament so that the scope of the mission and what exactly it is that we're asking the ADF to do can be made very clear, because it's certainly not clear to me. Michael Keenan. Well, I mean, thank God that we have countries in the world that are actually prepared to take some responsibility for things that happen around the globe. Um, I mean, we saw a situation... Do you mean, where... th do you mean the invasion in 2003? Or maybe he means no. Rwanda. Yeah. No, well, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> well... If anyone in this... Well, I mean, if anyone believes that it's a bad thing that the Australian government has joined with our allies to protect the Yazidi people who were going to be massacred by this barbaric organisation, uh, literally tens of thousands of people, I mean, if anyone believes that that's a bad thing, that Australia shouldn't be taking those sorts of humanitarian actions, or that our allies shouldn't be, um, then I would be very surprised. I shouldn't have to As, support well, I mean, a war in order to say that I'm against ISIS. There well, should be other solutions. Surely not, well, by now not, we realise... Well, we're not talking about a war. I'm talking about the humanitarian intervention that we took to make sure oh, so that these people weren't going to be massacred. Now, I mean, thank okay, God we now, do have now, countries um, in the world that are OK, to that's do a this. point taken. Um, yeah. What about the actual military uh, involvement, um, the bombing, uh, use of the SAS, etc.? Well, at the moment, we are taking part in a humanitarian mission and there's been no further decision taking about, taken about the way Australia... But you're sending fighter planes in the SAS, well, um, so it's uh, unlikely everybody they'll knows involved there's in a humanitarian been a, a, mission unless it's to save an individual group well, of people. Well, uh, the situation at the moment is that we've made a deployment to the Middle East, uh, one that's attracted the support of almost everyone in the parliament um, to uh, take part in a humanitarian mission. <coughs> now, the Prime Minister is going to New York uh, <coughs> tomorrow and he will talk to other like-minded and Western leaders and others in the Arab, uh, in the Arab world uh, about how we're going to tackle what is a very significant threat, which is the takeover uh, of parts of Syria and northern Iraq by a terrorist organisation. Um, now, I think it is absolutely right and proper that Australia, as a responsible world citizen, doesn't just think it's somebody else's responsibility, um, that we do take some ownership over the fact that, you know, we need to make sure um, that this... That, that, that we, that, that, um, Do you mean take ownership over the mess that was created by the previous individual? Uh, well, look, I, 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 I reject that. 
Tony, and I don't think that is that, that is a fair analysis at all. Do you think it was uh, a good politics, idea? Go back to the, the question that was put. Do you think it was a good idea to invade Iraq in two thousand and three? I think it is a very misplaced thing for us to be going back and revisiting that history. Let's just oh, no. the strategic amnesia. No, 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 no it's again. Not I'm that's so, the, I'm problem, sorry. That's no, the problem it's... of the West's failure to acknowledge the connection between their their imperial interests in the Middle East and the threat that comes to our soil. There is a connection there, and it's about time the West acknowledges the mess that it creates. And, and the fact is that we are, we are at risk now on our soil because of our involvement. And we're not going to be seduced by this circular logic that we have to go back into Iraq because the threat has increased when renewing our involvement increases the threat. We're not fools. We know what's been happening but in the last But do you seriously believe years. that the emergence of a terrorist state over part of the Middle East is not a threat to the security of the world? And Randa, uh, can, I just, can I just add to that another thought, and that is that the Iraqi government is, in this instance, calling for assistance because they face an existential threat. Mm. One of the things that I find really problematic about this whole discussion, particularly in Australia, is that we don't even get an, a sense or an understanding of the intricacies of these conflicts. I'm not an expert on this issue because I'm too busy battling Islamophobia to, to actually, and we're too busy talking about the narrative of Muslims as potential threats mm. in Australia, to actually get to the intricacies, as if any of us here actually understand what's going on over there, as if we really understand the mess that we have created over there and what needs to be done. It's high time that we move to actual proper debates about this and not just yeah. jump and say how high when the US goes in there, as if the US is going in there because of humanitarian okay, reasons. OK, I need to uh, mm. briefly, very briefly hear very from... Brief. Um, going back to the, to the question by Marty, yes, uh, our um, invasion of Iraq has played a huge, huge role in what's, uh, what's uh, happening at the moment. The fact is that ISIS is barbaric and I think that um, a large part of it is the Western intervention and what's happened. But um, I think that, that we also need to understand that there is a vacuum of power there and that ISIS has grown incrementally in um, Iraq and Syria because of that vacuum of power, because of uh, the lack of governance uh, of the Iraqi government. Um, and I think Australia, in terms of, of, of whether or not we go in or not, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If we stand by and do nothing, this, could this has already turned into a huge genocide. Make no mistake, ISIS is killing Muslims. Yeah. Left, right and centre, ISIS is killing Muslims. We OK, um, I'm sorry to say that we, uh, we did give a vote to our audience and uh, we have to interrupt this to go to that question because we've got very little time left. Uh, this is the one that comes has been voted for from our Twitter uh, audience. It comes from Caitlin Westrop. Thanks, Tony. My question is, can Australia's society's apparent struggle to accept the burqa be interpreted more as difficulty accepting how a woman could be better off covering herself completely every time she goes out in public than anything to do with terror terrorism? And is there a place for feminism in this debate? Uh, Randa, we'll bring you in here. I don't want to live in a country which feels that governments are entitled to tell women how to dress and you know, to Jackie Lambie and Corey Bernardi, if that's the kind of government that they want to live under, they should go to Saudi Arabia or Iran because it's in those countries that women's dress is regulated by the state. I, I completely support the, women, the right, right of a woman to choose to dress as she, as she likes. And with my interviews during my PhD research with people, it seems that the burqa, which, by the way, no one wears in Australia, the burqa is what you see in Afghanistan, the niqab is what you... The, the face veil. It seems that is the limit of multiculturalism. In fact, the niqab has made the hijab acceptable. <laughs> Once upon a time, the hijab was, was sort of the, the edge of multiculturalism, and now it's the, the niqab, which seems to be the, the tipping point for a lot of people when it comes to accepting difference in society. And I would just say, as a feminist, that women should be able to dress as they choose. And it's not our business to interrogate that decision. OK, we've got very little time left. Short answers from everyone. Michael Keenan. Uh, yes, I mean, it's not up to the government to tell people how to dress and uh, I wouldn't want to live in a country that does that. Um, so, do you ever tell that to your colleagues who claim otherwise? Uh, well, look, I haven't... Uh... <laughs> Look, I haven't had a conversation with Corey, who is a friend of mine. Why but, is he uh, so obsessed with the Well, burger? look, I haven't had a conversation with him about this. I mean, he is entitled to his view, but that is not mm. the view of the government. Could it, could it be time that you had a conversation with him about this? Uh, well, 
uh, he's entitled to his view, but that is not the view of the government. Uh, Scott, and he's just okay. one voice. Scott Ludlam. Ask me. I'm a white guy. Ask the Islamic women how they want to dress. <laughs> <laughs> OK. And I will ask you. I was going to anyway. Oh, well, I think that, um, you know, uh, every time politicians don't have anything intelligent to say, they tend to fall back on the default of the burqa. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think we, we pay our politicians a substantial amount of money and they have an obligation to be informed instead of bumbling through media um, media interviews and, and e equating terrorism with the burqa. So I'm saying to uh, Jackie Lambie, you can give me a call any time. I'll give you half an hour tutorial, Terrorism 101. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live in an Australia of respect and acceptance and I've got no time for the comments of Corey Bernardi and no time for the comments of Jackie Lambie in this. Um, those are inflammatory comments. This of all times is not a time when they should be saying those things and uh, I'm very heartened to hear the views that have been expressed here. And that is all I have time for. I'm sorry to say, please thank our panel, Scott Ludlam, Michael Keenan, Randa abdel Fattah, and as Ali and Mark Dreyfus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next Monday on Q&A, the Minister for Education, Leader of the House, Christopher Pine, former Treasurer, Wayne Swan, celebrated actor and activist, Tony Barry, the head of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kate Carnell, and the political editor of the Australian Financial Review, Laura Tingle. Until then, good night. <laughs>